Hi. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started and some more people make sure to in. I just want to welcome you to the School of Social Work. My name is Amy Kretaji and I'm director of the MSW program here. Um, this is a, a lecture, uh, this, uh, this lecture that's part of our speaker series that's sponsored, co-sponsored by the School of Social Work and the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy here. Today I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jamila Reed. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist and a co-director of the Parenting Clinic at the UW School of Nursing. She also participates in research, training, and delivery of child intervention at the Parenting Clinic um, as a specialist in the Incredible Years Child Treatment Program for children, particularly with composition of the plant disorders and conduct disorders. And Dr. Reed's research focuses on early intervention and prevention of conduct problems, um, including doing teacher, parent, and child focused interventions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jamila and get this. Um, well, hello. It is nice to meet you all. And what I'll be doing probably for the first 20 minutes or so is a PowerPoint where I give you some background about our program and then also about using evidence-based programs with um, young children with oppositional problems. During that, please feel free. I mean, I know with a lecture series it may be kind of hard to do this, but please feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. Um, I'm happy to be stopped. Um, for the second half of the lecture, what I'd like to do, I brought some videotapes of the actual intervention that we use, um, some of the videos that we use with parents, so that I can show you um, some of how that works and how we work with parents. We work with parents, and again, I'm hoping that that part can be a little bit more discussion based. So, um, interrupt me anywhere that you want. Today, I'm going to mostly focus the lecture on our parent training. Um, we also do work with um, the children directly, and we also have a teacher training. Um, highlight, I'll um, highlight those just briefly. But mostly today, the parent intervention is what I'd like to talk about. Um, this is the Incredible Years program, and it's, the bulk of the research on this program is in the two to eight year old age range. Um, Carol Webster Strack, who developed this program probably about 25 years ago, has done numerous uh, research studies on that age group. Um, just so that you know, she's more recently expanded the program. There is now um, a baby and an infant and an infant toddler series and also an older child series. Those have the more preliminary research data, but it's using the same model of parent training um, in a collaborative group model to work with both the younger and the slightly older spectrum. So just to give a little bit of background about why we work with the younger um, end of the age spectrum, and I suspect in this room that you don't need a lot of convincing that this is a good thing to do. Um, but a couple of statistics that um, kindergarten teachers, this is a um, fairly recent survey of kindergarten teachers who um, say that about half of kindergarten teachers are reporting that about half of the kids that come to kindergarten are not prepared to learn um, socially and um, with their emotional regulation um, and their social development. Um, they don't have the regulatory skills necessary to function at that age. Um, also, this is a pretty interesting graph. Don't worry too much about um, all of the numbers and things on the side, but these are four different tra trajectories of aggression in young children. Um, and um, we all know young children um, come into this world not very socialized, um, and somewhere around the toddler years, aggression is a pretty common way for kids to respond. Um, of course, they don't have the words, they don't have the emotional regulation skills to use um, more appropriate social skills. Um, so in all four of these lines on this graph, you'll see a blip around the one to three year old at um, age range. And for many children, that just rec that, um, represents normal development. Um, they may hit, they may push, they may bite, um, and through socialization, through their parents and their teachers helping them um, learn all the strategies, they will, um, you know, they'll grow out of that. Um, the bottom lip, um, you know, even among, even among toddlers, there are variations. So there's some kids who do it just a little bit, um, and that's the bottom lip. There's um, another, the red lip, the second line up, are kids who have a little bit higher rate, um, but still well within the normal developmental curve, um, and they grow out of it too. Um, the top two, and particularly the top line, are kids that we are more concerned about. Um, depending on the population, depending on who you're looking at, this might represent you know, anywhere between 2 or 3 percent, um, up to maybe more like 15 to 20 percent in a very high risk population. Um, these are the children who are initially showing very, very high rates of aggression compared to other children. and particularly for that highest clip, who don't seem to grow out there. Um, 
So without intervention, um, this becomes their means of interacting with the world. Um, maybe it goes a little bit down in the middle school years, and then again you see another blip um, as they approach adolescence, and that's the sort of serious building for kind of behavior, and these are the children who end up um, becoming bigger problems um, with conduct disorder and then antisocial um, behavior in adulthood, um, and possibly also being involved with the criminal justice system. So the children that we tend to work with are from these top two blips, and sometimes it can be hard to tell who's going to be in the green category and who's going to be in the black category. So all of those children in this young age range who have higher levels of aggression are children that we might see in our clinic, or these are also children who are, you know, you're going to see in your practices, or you're going to see um, in people you're working with, because these are children who are causing substantial um, problems for the teachers and for their parents. Um, all of those kids, um, it goes without saying, are very high risk for outcomes that are not so good later on. So in the younger years, um, for problems in your school settings, um, beginning on a trajectory of underachievement in school, of peer relationship difficulties, and then as they get older, um, of delinquency, um, school dropout, um, violence, and substance abuse. Um, Again, this is probably not new to any of you, but just sort of thinking about where you're intervening, um, we think of these kids as having risk factors coming from multiple different areas. So there are risk factors that are inherent to the child. Um, so children temperamentally come, you know, come to this world with whatever they come to. Um, some children are temperamentally more difficult. So they um, may have, many of these children may have hyperactivity or impulsivity problems. Um, they also may just have deficits in social skills. Um, they don't learn social skills as easily as other children, and it's just something that's not they're not as good at. Um, academic and learning problems do seem to go along with these kinds of problems too. Some of that's a little bit of a chicken egg problem. You know, if you are hyperactive, it may be harder for you to learn, and therefore um, you may show those learning problems. Or you know, you may be hyperactive because it's difficult to learn. But regardless, those two things seem to go together. Um, and some children, um, right from the beginning, just have more negative emotionality, um, are harder to regulate. It's harder for them to regulate. So the kid problems come with the kid. Um, but obviously, also, family and environmental factors then start to play a huge um, role in interacting with those child behaviors, um, too. So um, parent interpersonal and personal um, characteristics or um, relationship difficulties family history of criminal behavior, substance abuse, um, and you know, many of those things that disrupt family life. Um, just divorce, um, adoption, foster care, and then parenting skills. Um, this is one of the things that we focus on because it is something that is amenable to change. Um, some of these other areas, it's hard to certainly want to help with as many other family risk factors, factors as possible, but those are pretty hard to change. Um, parenting um, on our parenting program is one of the ways that we really try to bolster uh, those skills so they become a protective factor for children rather than a risk factor. Um, and high levels of stressors, um, poverty being one of those things, um, can contribute to, to this kind of uh, to the, the uh, risk factor for children. Um, lastly, um, the third area is the school risk factors. Um, so, what children um, are exposed to in terms of their school setting. We know that classrooms where teachers have fewer classroom management skills um, can contribute to children's behavior problems. Poor homeschool connections, um, maybe because parents have had a history of having to have the challenging relationships with schools themselves, um, or because the school does not have as many resources to reach out to parents. Um, overall levels of classroom aggression. So if, if your child happens to be in a classroom where there are you know, more than one or two children, with temperamental difficulties, with um, aggressive behaviors that can feed upon itself um, and can actually perpetuate the aggression. Um, peer rejection um, and the classrooms where there's not a focus on social and emotional development and growth and all the things that are not challenging for those children. Um, so, what many people, oh, so early intervention, um, just a plug for the earlier that you're working with kids um, and their families, the better. These risk factors have a way of intertwining and cascading um, so that they become more and more entrenched. Um, and at the younger age range, one of the primary socializing you know, influences in a child's life is parents. 
Um, so you can work on a slightly smaller scope than when these children get to be adolescents and they're out interacting with the world as independent beings and you have their peer groups, um, maybe you have law enforcement, maybe you have a lot of other um, things that also need your attention with intervention. So the younger the better um, in terms of who you have to intervene with and also um, just the history of how long these behaviors have been um, entrenched in a child's life. Um, if you have a you know, a two to three year history versus a 10 year history of these behavior problems, um, there it's much easier to treat. So a lot more bang for your buck as far as working on supporting children younger. Um, we are not alone in this, but thinking about um, when you're intervening with children this age, um, the more of the risk factors you can target, the better. So our programs do have a um, teacher component on the very top there. So one of the things that we do is work with teachers, groups of teachers um, in classroom management, helping them understand um, how to interview with these children and also with their whole classroom, how to help them support social skills and use non creative discipline in their classrooms. Um, we also have a child program where we work directly with the children. Um, because for many of these children, these social skills um, and emotion regulation skills are not something that comes easily. And for them, having some continued practice and having a safe environment to do that actually does have some research data behind it in terms of being an effective way to work with kids. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the parent program. And I would say, all in all, in terms of bang for your buck, if you could only do one thing, this is where we would put our resources and our money. Um, each of our programs, we've tested them alone and in conjunction with the other programs. The parenting program gets the most effect. Uh, the teacher and the child both do add um, to the parent program. So if you, if you have a child who has behavioral difficulties across settings, so a child who already is having problems at home and school, certainly uh, adding a child component or the teacher component I think would be quite important there. Many children start out with the behavior problems in the home and then they escalate to other settings. So if you've got a child who has just a home problem, um, or if you have limited resources, you can start with that parent program because the parents, um, the parents are going to be with this child, um, hopefully for years and years, um, and are kind of socializing agents who can then help communicate things to other environments. That's it. That's it. Okay. Um, all of our programs also have a treatment component and a prevention. So we work both with, and we have researched both, um, children who have diagnosed chronic problems, who mostly at the age we're working with, um, it would be oppositional defiant disorder. Many of those children also have ADHD. Um, some of those children on the older edge end, end of the spectrum are starting to get into the kind of disorder um, category, but mostly oppositional defiant disorder. So we work with a group um, in our treatment programs. Um, those are children we see as meeting fairly intense levels. Um, our treatments are longer um, for those kids and are more intense. We also have prevention programs, and those are programs that we have done in mostly in school settings um, with schools that are at higher risk, usually because of poverty. Um, so we've worked a lot with Head Start and we've worked with some lower income elementary schools in terms of delivering our programs to you know, all of the children or all of the parents in those settings. So. Um, in mind that there are two different versions, um, either might be appropriate depending on the population. 